Do you swear or affirm the testimony you have to give? Is it true to help you back? I do. Okay, please step up and have a seat. Sean, S H A W N, Hopkins, H O P K I N S. Go ahead, Pastor. Thank you. Sir, how are you? I'm here. Sir, do you work with for the, do you work for the Oxford School District? Uh, I have been employed for the Oxford School District. I am currently on leave okay. at this moment. Now, I'd like to direct your attention specifically to the fall of 2021. Were you working with Oxford School District at that point? Yes, I was. In what role? I was a counselor at Oxford High School. Okay. And tell us, please, what general duties are associated with that particular role? Um, I managed a caseload of about 400 students. With that, I was in charge of scheduling for those students, um, preparing them for life after high school by, by helping them kind of look through different potential job opportunities, um, caring for social-emotional uh, wellness for students, um, and being kind of just a general person who would be consistent throughout their time in high school working with them. Okay. You said you had a caseload of about 400 students? Yes. How many students went to Oxford High School that particular time? There were approximately 1,800 students um, divided amongst four counselors. There were 1,600 and then approximately 200 in an early college program as well. So in November, excuse me, in November of 2021, approximately how long had you been employed with Oxford High School? I started as an intern in 2014 and was hired full-time in fall of 2015. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your background, please. Um, I came out of college, graduated with a degree in youth ministry, worked as a youth pastor starting in 2009, um, and then did that and went back to school for a master's degree in counseling. I graduated with that, um, actually walked in December of 2014 and started working in the high school thereafter. Okay. Now you mentioned your role included helping students transition into post-secondary uh, either education or employment, scheduling, as well as social, emotional issues. Yes. Would one of those roles take precedence? It would ebb and flow depending on the time of year, but there was never anything that you did that was, this is the most important thing because to it was what student you were with at the time. Okay. To a senior going to college, helping them with that college application took precedence in that moment. To a student sitting in front of you with social emotional needs, that took precedence in that moment. So <clears throat> did you have regular check-ins with students or was it as needed basis? It depended on what it was for. We did have regular meetings with students in regards to scheduling, but when it came to social emotional, that was more of an as needed basis. Did your role as a counselor involve disciplining students? No. Okay, who, who took care of that? That would have been the dean or our administration. Okay. At the, in November of 2021, who was the dean? Nikki Jack. All right, and did you work with him a lot? No, I didn't. He was actually new to the district that year. Okay. So is there a reason why the counselor would be separate from the discipline of students? The counselor's role was to be a student advocate, um, to remain on the side of the student um, through difficult situations oftentimes, um, to give the student somebody that they could build that trust and rapport with, where the dean would be enforcing code of conduct. What code of conduct? What's that? Uh, the standards that are expected to be followed by students. Okay, so a rule? Would that be fair? That would be a part of it, okay. yes. Yes. Now, in the fall of 2021, was Oxford High School in person, hybrid, or remote? Oxford High School was in person. Okay. Were all students and teachers wearing face masks at that point? Yes, they were. In the fall of 2021, what sort of issues, issues would you face with the student's social emotional health? Social emotional health was definitely on our radar in the fall of 2021. Um, coming out of COVID, coming out of time being out from school, the anxiety that was associated with that time period, we saw a lot of issues for students. Um, 
whether it be anxiety, whether it be depression, and in a few cases, it was suicide attempts. Okay. Now, that year, did you encounter any students who actually had attempted suicide? I did. How many? Uh, at least four. So are you familiar with the term suicidal ideation? Yes, I am familiar with that term. Could you please explain to us what that means? Suicidal ideation yeah, is... I'm going to object to relevance. Judge, I believe this witness will testify that he indicated that the defendant's son was expressing signs of suicidal ideation that was expressed to the defendant. Well, that was his belief at the time, right? So I'm going to allow it. Thank you. What's suicidal ideation? Suicidal ideation is looking at themes, ideas, behaviors, which could be associated with suicide. So when you take sadness, depression, anxiety, those on their own aren't necessarily suicidal. And when we look at them, we may see somebody who's not actively suicidal that may not be expressing a date or a plan or a method, but we see themes that if left unchecked could be associated with potentially becoming suicidal. Okay. Now, as your role as a counselor at Oxford High School, as you dealt with students who were expressing suicidal ideation, separate from those who actually attempted suicide? Yes. Could you put a number on how many? Dozens. Now, with, you mentioned that there were four counselors for a school of around 1,700, 1,800 or so. Um, how was it that each student was assigned to a counselor? Of the students who are not in the early college program, they were divided out alphabetically okay. um, amongst their counselors. Was James Crumbly's son one of the students assigned to your caseload in November 2021? Yes. Is James Crumbly in court today? Yes, he is. Could you please point to him and describe something he's wearing today? He is seated at this table wearing a suit coat with a blue tie. Your Honor, would the record re reflect identification of the defendant? The record would reflect the in-court identification of the defendant, James Crumbly. Sir, when is the first time that you would have interacted with James Crumbly's son? The first time that I likely interacted with him would have been scheduling during his freshman year. Okay, so for context, November of 2021, he was a sophomore, is that right? That is correct. Okay, so this would have been August or September of 2020? No. Um, when students are in eighth grade, they're scheduled at the middle school level. Okay. I may or may not have been in his classroom because it's divided out within their eighth grade classrooms. And we're not really, we don't know the students at all at that point. Okay. I would have done scheduling with him during his freshman year, approximately February of 2021. February of 21. Yes. Okay. Those meetings were done virtually and were not in depth and were only to discuss their next year's schedule. Do you remember anything about that meeting? If you I don't it? remember that meeting in particular. Right. Now I'm going to show you. First of all, if you recall, when is the next time that you had any interaction with the defendant's son? I don't recall this particular meeting, but I know that there was a phone call in spring of 2021 okay. um, from a teacher to me. And then I called into the student's classroom to meet with the student. Okay. I do not remember that meeting. All right, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as Exhibit 198. This is an email, May 13, 2021, 146 in the afternoon. Without telling us that person's name, who was that person who sent you the email? Without telling... Well, who, does, does she work there at Oxford High School? She was an English teacher English at Oxford teacher. High School. Okay. And the email is, hi, when you get a chance, can you call the defendant's son down and see how he's doing? He is failing my class and tries to sleep all the time. In class, thanks. That's Exhibit 198, May 13, 2021. You received this email? Yes, I did. Okay. And the response from you at 2.07 p.m. is, I'll catch him before the end of the day. And then her response at 2.08 was, thanks, just a little worried. Okay, did you have any interaction with the defendant's son because of this email? I have, um, through phone records, I called into a student's classroom and called him down to my office. I okay. don't remember that particular meeting. Okay. But at least your recollection is that you would have had that meeting. The evidence from everything suggests that I had that meeting. Sure, that's fair. Did you contact either James or Jennifer Crumbly then? I did not. Okay. 
in why or why not? It was a check-in, um, and it didn't raise to the level of concern where I would contact the parent. Now, as a counselor with Oxford High School, do you have a sort of method or protocol for when you determine when to contact a parent? There isn't a set, like, there isn't always a set level of when you do it, but when something becomes repeated or when something becomes more concerning, um, I am going to then involve a parent. Okay. Are grades available to parents on a district-wide basis? Yes, they are. They are available through a system called PowerSchool, which is available online. Okay, and that's the system that a parent can log in daily if they would choose to? As often as they would like. Now, the next interaction you had with the defendant's son would be September 2021? I did not actually have an interaction with the defendant's son. Um, I received information about the defendant's son. Okay, I'm showing you Exhibit 199. This is an email from a different teacher to you, September 8, 2021? Yes. Okay. And why don't you go ahead and read um, the email here that you received. Hi, Sean. Could you please touch base with students? In his autobiography poem, he said that he feels terrible and that his family is a mistake. Unusual responses for sure. Okay, that is September the 8th, 2021. Do you recall any interaction with the defendant's son at that point? I do not. Okay. Now, do you recall any meetings, check-ins, or phone calls from September to November of 2008? Or 2021? No. So to give context on this, what I did was have a conversation with the teacher um, to gain a little more context of what was meant by the email. And then the teacher filled me in that the student was actually joking with others in the class um, and that it was not at the level of concern that she had believed when she sent the email. Okay. So if I'm correct, then you received the email, then you... They contact with the teacher who sent you the email? Yes. Okay, and then the determination was made that no further involvement was required? Correct. Okay. I'm going to show you what's... Oh, this is your response. Thanks for the heads up. I'm in senior meetings throughout the day, but we'll try and catch up with them. That was to the same teacher, September 8, 2021, 915? Yes, that is correct. This is People's Exhibit 200. This is November the 10th, 2021. Um, the same teacher emailed you, hi Sean, the defendant's son is having a rough time right now, he might need to speak with you. Do you recall that email? I do. Okay. And tell us what you did when you received that email. I, I checked in with the student um, in the hallway in between classes to just let them know that if they were having a hard time that I was available to talk to them. Okay. And uh, here's your response at 440. 4 p.m. I'm sorry, I was in a meeting through the end of the day. I'll catch up with them. Yes. So you recall that interaction with the defendant's son? Yes. Okay, tell us about that, please. It was in between classes. Um, I believe the morning after I had responded to this email, um, and I just spoke to him briefly in passing to let him know that if he needed to talk um, for any reason that I would make myself available for him. Okay. Did you make a decision to contact a, a parent at that point? I did not. Okay. You did not contact a parent? I did not contact a parent. And tell us why, please. Because I wanted to gain any information from the student and allow the student the opportunity um, to talk. Being sad isn't unusual, um, but if I had no information other than a student is sad, I, it's not something I would call a parent over. <laughs> Now, when's the next time you had any interaction with the defendant's son? November 29th. All right, I'm going to show you what's been minutes, people's 201. This is an email um, from a teacher to uh, Mr. Ejack and Ms. Fine, and you eventually were CC'd on this email? I was forwarded this email. Okay. Yes. And the email says Good morning, I had a student during first hour today, the defendant's son was on his phone looking at different bullets at the end of first hour today as I was walking around the room passing out their essays. I didn't get a chance to investigate it a bit further since it was the end of the hour. Now that he's on my radar, I'm also noticing some of his previous work that he's completed from earlier in the year leans a bit toward the violent side. I can bring down these things later today during my fifth hour prep if you would like them. 
And then it was forwarded to you at 9.34 a.m.? Yes, it was. Okay. And then your response was, thanks, Jacqueline, I'll be touching base with him as well. Yes. Okay, and tell us what happened with this, please. Um, I ended up going down to Ms. Fine's office, who was on the initial email. So who's Ms. Fine? She was our restorative practices coordinator okay. at that time. Um, and she called the student down to her office uh, to chat about the email that had been sent. Were you present for that meeting? I was present for that meeting. Okay, tell us about that, please. Uh, the student came down towards the end of the second class of the day, um, and Ms. Fine led the meeting. Um, I was there to be a support for the student in case it became a disciplinary issue. Um, but it was very cordial. Uh, we say support for the student in case it became a disciplinary issue. That's not for you to discipline, correct? That is correct. I would be there just as somebody who's able to be a comfort to the student okay. um, during a time where they may potentially be experiencing discipline. Now, at that point, was everybody wearing a uh, COVID face mask? Yes, they were. And in fact, had you ever interacted with the defendant's son without a COVID face mask? No, I did not. So you said Ms. Fine led the meeting? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yes, Ms. Fine did lead the meeting. Um, she had a conversation with the student about the email that was received. Um, and, and let it in a way to see if the student would, would bring any information available um, based on what the email was received, where she asked him, were you looking at anything in class? Were you looking, like, what teacher were you looking at um, this information in class to see if he would acknowledge that it was Ms. Kavina who sent the email? He did, he was compliant during that meeting. Um, and the conversation centered around how it was not school appropriate. Um, the student understood, or at least stated he understood, um, and was returned to class. A uh, phone call was then placed to the student's mom from Ms. Fine. Okay, and we heard that uh, last week during the trial. That was from Ms. Fine to Jennifer Crumbly? That is correct. Okay, and um, was that a voicemail that was left? It was left as a voicemail, yes. Did the defendant's son indicate that he had received a gun for Christmas a few days before? No. So what happened next? In, in terms of that meeting? Yes. The meeting was over, he returned to class. How long was the meeting? Five to ten minutes. Okay. Now, in the realm of either discipline or your role as a counselor, what does it take to move from a check-in to a phone call? It can be subjective. Oftentimes it would be if there's information we feel that is necessary for parents to know. Um, somewhere it's obvious is if you feel the student may be a threat to himself or if there's any potential that that could be a possibility. Um, if you have concerning information that the student has shared. Um, or it could just be simply to confirm what a student has said is true. So that's a phone call home. What does it take to actually call the parents in for a meeting immediately? I would have to have a high level of concern that needed parental involvement. Right. And when was the next time you had any interaction with the defendant's son? November 30th. Okay, so that would be Tuesday the next day? Yes. All right. So let's talk about the 30th. I'm going to show you People's Exhibit 202. This is an email on Tuesday, November 30th, 2021, 8.05 a.m. Um, from a teacher to you, Ms. Fine. Uh, good morning. I know Jackie emailed you guys yesterday with some concerns about the defendant's son in our first hour class. Today he's watching videos on his phone of a guy gunning down people. It looks like it's a movie scene and not security footage slash real event, but definitely still concerning when taking into account some of his other behaviors. Just wanted to keep you guys updated. Do you recall receiving that email? I do. Do you remember when you received it? Well, uh, it was sent at 8.05. I believe I saw it approximately 20 to 30 minutes later. Okay. And what was your reaction when you received this email? My initial reaction was frustration of a student that just had a conversation about school-appropriate behavior. Um, and I wanted to, to make sure that I met with him. Okay. 
So this is Exhibit 203. This is from another teacher to you at 9.32 a.m. Again, Tuesday, November 30th. Here's the photo I took of his paper in case you need it with a um, picture of a math assignment. Now, what happened in between the time you saw this email at the Senate 805 to this email sent at 932? Okay. So I was on the phone with um, other parents at the time I received the first email. And when I was done with that phone call, um, at that time, Mr. Ejack actually was in my office as I was wrapping up the phone call. Okay. He had been presented with a picture of the math assignment from the math teacher and wanted to make sure I was involved in that this conversation. I don't know exactly what it was. I know he was showing a picture on a cell phone. Okay. Um, I would believe it was the initial one, but I do not know that for a fact I never saw the cell phone. That's fair. Um, so he wanted to involve me in a conversation with the student about the math assignment. And I wanted to talk to the student about the email that had been sent that morning. I do not know if he was on that email, Mr. E. Jack was on that email about the watching the video or not. Okay. Um, so we saw, we talked about the email from that morning, we're referring to this email regarding yes. the, the video. Yes. Okay. So this is the information I had at the time that I was making a decision to meet with the student, and Mr. E. Jack had the information that there was a math assignment with something on it. So at the time that you decided to meet with the defendant's son, you hadn't even seen this picture yet? That is correct. Okay. So Go ahead. when I, when Mr. Reject came and mentioned that there was something going on with the student, I made the decision that I was going to go to the math class and retrieve the student. Um, it's less concerning oftentimes for a counselor to walk into a class than a dean um, because I could be talking about 50 different things with the student. Okay. Um, so it just isn't going to raise suspicion for others. Um, so I went to the class and asked the student if he could come with me, and I grabbed the math assignment um, as part of it. You so say grabbed the math assignment. So you was going to admit it as Exhibit 128. Now, this math assignment looks different than the one that was emailed to you. Did you receive an explanation as to why? I didn't know there was a difference initially because for the first 30 minutes, all I had was the actual physical copy. And that would be this in Exhibit 128? Yes. Okay. Yes. So as I was meeting with the student in the office, I had the email about what had been sent about watching videos, and I had the copy that is currently on the screen of the math assignment. Um, so I initially asked the student what, what was what was it that you were watching in class? Why am I receiving an email from a teacher one day after I know you just had a conversation about what's appropriate in school and what's not? The student told me he was watching a video game on his phone. Not uncommon, also not school appropriate, especially given the context of what we had just had in the conversation. Okay. So we had a conversation about making that good choice and making wise choices. And then I, I grabbed the math assignment and I put it in between the student and I. Um, so Mr. E. Jack was actually in that meeting as well. He sat kind of off to my right. The student was across from me, across from my desk. Um, and I asked him, okay, so we can talk about, you know, making good choices in the classroom, but let's talk about this. So I put the assignment in between us. Um, and what and, stood out to you when you saw this? Well, I wanted him to, to explain it to me, but some of the things that actually stood out to me the most were what was written on it. Um, because I, I read something like, the thoughts won't stop, and I could read help me underneath it being crossed out. Um, Is this the part right here that I'm highlighting? Yes. Okay. Um, I read harmless act. I saw what looked like one body, and my initial concern was the this student's drawing some things that lead me to think he might hurt himself. Okay. So I asked him to explain what's on here, because I didn't want it to just be me interpreting what he wrote. I wanted to hear what he had to say about it. And he told me initially that it was a video game, that he liked, liked drawing video game characters, liked, 
liked that area of entertainment and that he wanted to go into video game design. So then I, I told him, okay, you can tell me that, but let's explain these words. Here, here you write, the thoughts won't stop. Here you write, harmless act. And here you write, I'd have to look at it, I think it was like, my life is useless or something like that, where he crossed it out. This part that's highlighted right here? Yeah, and, and I said, that doesn't sound like a video game to me. So I take it then you didn't accept his explanation of the video game? Not in totality, no, because I wanted to gain more context. So did you make a decision at that point to do something? Well, as he continued talking, um, he then started talking about things that were going on in his What life. do you mean things that are going on? Well, he mentioned that school's been tough during COVID, that a family member had passed recently, a family dog had died. He said a, a friend moved away. And, and as he was talking, I just kept hearing all these themes of sadness. What was and his demeanor like? Appropriately sad. Um, it matched what he was saying. Okay. And, and so at that point, I, I told him, okay, this is a lot that you've, you've got going on, and I want to make sure that we get you help. Um, and so I told him, when, when I hear all of this, what, what I do is I, I'm going to call a parent. And I asked him, is there a parent you'd rather I call? He told me mom would probably be easier to get a hold of. So I, I called mom first and left a voicemail. This would have been approximately 20 to 25 minutes after the meeting started. Okay. Um, so at this point, I, I, I just decided that it was enough that I wanted to involve a parent. All right. You said you called mom first and left a voicemail. I did. Did you also call the defendant, James Crumbly? I did, and it was right after leaving a voicemail. I'm not entirely sure if he answered or not. I think he did, but it was almost like it was almost like there was just air on the other end. Okay. Um, so I wasn't able to leave a message or anything. Mom then called me back uh, a few minutes later, and and we talked for I would guess five or six minutes. Um, she was on speakerphone with her son. Um, for a brief part of that conversation, and I asked her to please be able to come in, um, that I, I had some concerns I wanted to go over. I texted her... Did you specify those concerns? Well, I texted her a picture of the math assignment, um, and by that time, I also then received the email that I think you put up earlier so, of the math assignment. By this point in time, this was 9.32 a.m. that Ms. Morgan sent it, was the defendant's son already in your office at that point? Yes. Okay. And then did you have a chance to look at this picture as well? I looked briefly at it, but I was already on the phone with mom at that point. Okay. This is exhibit 130. This is what we refer to as the original drawing. Okay. And you said you were on the phone with Jennifer Crumley at that point? Yes. Yeah, so I emailed her then the original drawing as well. Okay. So you sent this to, to the, the student's mother? Yes. Okay. And did you have a chance to look at this? I did look at it. Um, most of it confirmed what I thought was under the scribble outs, and I also noticed some words were added. Okay. What words stuck out, stood out to you? What do you mean? When you said words were added, what, what did you notice? I, on the one where he added words, I, I know he added like OHS rocks or we're all friends here, which I, I kind of took as just a 15-year-old writing things. It okay. didn't... So you're referring to this exhibit 128, some additional words. Yes, there. he added video game this is, OHS rocks, I think I love my life so much was added. Okay. Things that were facetious. And that was after he was seen with this, is that correct? Is that, it was he, after he created this, exhibit 130. Yes, the, it, ex, it existed in its form as exhibit 130 prior to the edits that okay. I had seen on the paper. Now, at some point, did both James and Jennifer Crumbly come to your office? 
Yeah, so I ended up being on the phone with mom for that five to six minutes. She stated she was going to try and get dad to come to the office and she was unable to. Um, and so during that point, we had about 20 minutes um, where I was sort of just waiting. During that time, I, I showed the student the list of resources I was going to give to his parents. Um, Tell me about that, please. It was about a three-page list of just different mental health um, services in the area. On it, it gave contact information for them. It gave um, specialization areas for them. And it gave oftentimes insurance, um, if it was accepted, if they worked without insurance, um, anything that they would work with payment plans. So I wanted him to see what I would be providing his parents. Was the defendant's son with you from the point that you brought him out of class to the point that James and Jennifer Crumley arrived at school? Yes. Okay. And approximately how long was that? It was approximately an hour and a half. Um, so around, I, I want to say a little before 10, probably like 9.45, 9.50, I received another call from mom. Um, stating that she was unable to get a hold of dad and that she would be coming in. Okay. Now, if I told you that we saw surveillance video that indicated you welcomed them, both James and Jennifer, in your office at 10.40 a.m., does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. Now, what was your expectations of what was to happen at the end of that meeting? My hope was that they were going to take him and either take him to get help or even just to take him to let's have a good day. Let's have a, let's have a day where we just spend time with you, where we are with you. To take him out of school? Yeah. Did you believe that he could be left alone at that point? I didn't want him left alone. Um, I didn't want to make that decision that he was okay to be left alone. So that's why I stayed with him for as long as I did, until I had parents there. <clears throat> Did you express to the student or his parents that you identified suicidal ideation? Yes, I, I said that I, the student, when I asked the student if he had a plan, if he was a threat to himself or others, the student said, his, his words were something to the effect of, I can see why this looks bad, I'm not going to do anything. So I had all this information, but the student was saying he wasn't going to be doing anything. Um, so when the parents came in, I went over all of the things I had seen um, with over my time with the student. Um, that he expressed the sadness over, over a dog passing. He expressed that COVID has been hard, that a family member passed, that a friend left. Um, he expressed a, an argument the night before with parents. Um, Did he tell you de details about the argument? No. Did he tell you that he received the gun a few days ago? No. Tell us about the meeting when James and Jennifer arrived. It was initially odd to me that they were both there because I wasn't expecting that. Um, but not to the point where I asked anything about it, just it was unexpected. Um, both parents followed me back to my office. Um, the student, that was the one time he was in there by himself, was when I went out to greet the parents and brought them back. Um, and uh, the student and his dad sat across from me, and mom sat in a chair kind of diagonal from me. And Mr. Ejack had left once we had confirmed parents were coming, and he returned for that portion of the meeting. Um, so really, I felt like parents were confirming what I had said without giving additional information. Well, hang on, let me, let me ask you about that. You say confirming without giving additional information. I want to make sure I understand what you mean by that. So first of all, you've had these kind of meetings with parents in the past? I have. Okay. When you say confirming, is that something that would typically happen in these meetings? It could, um, but oftentimes you may gain additional 
um, information. As you know, as a school employee, I I had 90 minutes. Okay. He's 15 years old. So, did James or Jennifer give you any additional information? No. Okay. So tell me what you did and, and what what was said. So to start off the meeting, I asked mom if she had received if she had received the phone call from the previous day and that those events were true. She said yes. Um, I talked about how how the student had expressed these different areas of sadness that his dog had passed, yes, a uh, family member had passed, yep, uh, friends left, um, and all of those were just confirmed. Um, Were there so, any details about the circumstances of the friend leaving and the impact on their son? I didn't know any details about it. No. They didn't share any with you? No. Okay. I'm sorry. I interrupted again. Go ahead. It's okay. Um, so, so a lot of it was I felt like I was bringing information and they knew it, but I wasn't, I wasn't gaining information. Um, so at that point, I, I know I handed mom the list of resources and, and said I, I'd like him to get support outside of here. I'd like him to get help and have somebody that he can talk to. Um, and mom made mention that they would, but they couldn't right away. So I told mom that I, I wanted him to get help as soon as possible, today if possible, and, and was told that wasn't possible. Okay, told by James, Jennifer, or both? By Jennifer. Okay. Um, James, at that time, to my memory, was talking with his son. Do you recall what he said? I remember it, yes. He was looking at the math assignment with his son. We say math assignment, are we talking about this It's the hard, the hard copy. So we're referring to this, Exhibit 128? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and he was talking to his son and mentioned that, you know, you have people you can talk to. Um, you can talk to your counselor, you have your journal, we talk. Um, and, and it felt appropriate at that time, but... At that point, did he share any details about anything you had discussed? I don't, I don't recall any additional details, no. Um, but my concern at that point was that there wasn't any action happening. When his wife said that they can't, did he protest that? No. So you said you had a concern that no action was happening, so what did you decide to do? Well, I, I told them that uh, with getting help, I, I said I wanted to see movement on 48 out, within 48 hours, and that I'd be following up. Okay. So um, if the shooting didn't occur, what, what was your plan? I was going to meet with the student the next morning and see if they had had conversations about it, if they had made some plans to move towards some sort of therapy. And if that didn't occur, what were you going to do? I was going to call Child Protective Services. Now, generally speaking, within Oxford High School, is it preferred to send the, school, the student home when an issue arises or keep the student at school? I'm not sure I understand what you mean with that. So you didn't force, you didn't call the police? As a counselor, I can't send a student home okay. anyway. But you didn't want him to be alone? I didn't want him to be alone. So in this context, my thought was when parents were saying they had to return to work, I wanted to make sure the student was with people. Okay. Um, because my concern was him. It was his well-being and his, his ability to be safe and cared for. Did James Crumbly elaborate at all on the fight they had the night before? No. Now how long did the... Tell us how the meeting ended. Jennifer asked if they were done. Um, which felt abrupt. And uh, during that time, the student had also expressed interest. He, he wanted to go back to class. I asked uh, Mr. Ejack if there was any, like from a discipline standpoint, is there anything you need to do? Is there any reason he, he can't go to class? Um, and I was told no. Um, so I wrote him a pass to return to his end of his third hour. Okay. 
Um, and Jennifer asked, are we done here? Did James protest at all? No. So tell us what happened as you wrote the student in the past. I told the student that I cared about him um, and wanted him to know that I just wanted him to know that. Did either James or Jennifer say that to him? No. Mr. Hopkins, do you have any knowledge of firearms? I very limited. Would you know what this firearm depicts? What kind of firearm? A handgun. Is that the extent of your knowledge? Yeah. What about this, this bullet here? A bullet. Just a bullet? And neither James nor Jennifer said anything about the firearm or the bullet? No. Now, you indicated that you passed on a three-page list of resources for, for mental health providers? I did. Okay. I'm going to show you a screenshot of 137 here. In James's hand, does this appear to be that list of resources? Objection. I, I would say that calls for speculation. I don't think Mr. Hopkins knows what's in Mr. Cumbly's hand. Do you know what's in his hand? I know that it's multiple pages of paper, and I handed him a stapled three-page piece of paper. Okay. Did you see anything in Jennifer Cumbly's hands? I do not. Or a phone. And something in her right hand, but I'm not sure. Maybe. I see a phone. High school counselor, how many times have you had to call a parent in and tell the, either mom or dad or guardian that you identified suicidal ideation in their child? 15 to 20, over a dozen. Okay. Any of those meetings, did a parent fail to take their child home? I can't think of any, no. Now, you indicated this was a confirming responses from James and Jennifer Crumbly. In those other meetings, were parents sharing information? Oftentimes, yes. Um, oftentimes, parents would come in and, and want to paint a more complete picture of their student, of their situation. Um, oftentimes, all the time, I, I feel... Parents know their kids better than I do. I have, I, with, if all I ever did was meet with students, I might have two hours a year with each student. Do you rely upon the parent for that information? Absolutely. I've got the further. Thank you, Jen. Class? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Hopkins. Good morning. I'm going to go back. To your first interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son. Um, I'm not going to use his name, so if for some reason the way that I'm referring to his son confuses you, just let me know. If we're using too many he's, he's. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, I will do that. Thank you. So your first interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son were in the fall of 2020. Well, fall of 2020. No, it would have been spring of 2021. Okay. So it would have been before the 2021 school year? Yes. And that was for um, planning his class schedule, is that correct? That would have been the main reason that we would have met with every freshman. Um, and then I had that email that was displayed earlier from his English teacher. The May of, of 2021 email? Yes. And after that May of 2021 email, you didn't specifically recall having a meeting with Mr. Crumbly's son. I don't have memory of that meeting, no. You, in fact, you went back and reviewed your records and determined that there, there appears to have been a phone call. That you called him, you called him down to your office? I called into his class and, and called him down to my office. Okay, but you don't remember ever meeting with him? I don't remember the meeting. You did not contact... Mr. Crumbly or his wife after that May of 2021 email. That is correct. So other than discussing his 
Mr. Crumbly's son's class schedule with him and then maybe meeting with him in May of 2021 about that email, you don't recall any additional interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son before November 10th of 2021. That is correct. In September of 2021, you received another email from a teacher which was displayed, I believe it was Exhibit 198, sorry, 199, um, which would be the, uh, an email from a teacher talking about a poem. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that he had a school, a class assignment of writing an autobiography poem. And he had said to that teacher he'd made some concerning statements in that poem. Yeah, so if I can give a little more context to this, this was actually a Spanish class, so the poem wouldn't have even been in English. Okay, so he used words in Spanish? That is my understanding after talking to the teacher. And the Spanish teacher had concerns about the Spanish words that he used? That is my understanding based on the email. I also followed up with the teacher and gained further context about it. Right, and as a result of gaining further context, you were not concerned. Because the teacher lowered the level of concern for me, yes. So even though your response that you were going to catch up with Mr. Crumbly's son, even though that's in the email, you didn't actually meet with him because you had the conversation with the teacher. That is correct. Again, you didn't notify James Crumbly or his wife about the teacher's concern in September of 2021. No, I did not. And you didn't forward them the email? No. And that was because in your mind, based on the information that you had, there was nothing to be concerned about? Well, I just gained further context from the teacher and made the decision based off of that information. And had no concerns? I think that you're putting those words in to make it a little more extreme. But what I would say is I gained context and made a decision based off of that. And if you had been concerned... If you had had sufficient concern, you would have reached out to Mr. Crumbly or his wife. If it had raised the level of concern where I felt I needed to, I would have, yes. So then on November 10th of 2021, you received another email from a different teacher. From the same teacher. Oh, thank you for correcting me. It was the same teacher. She asked you to check in with Mr. Crumbly's son on November 10th. She said he might need to speak with you. And she said that she believed he was having a hard time? She said he's having a rough time right now. He might need to speak with you. The next day, you responded and indicated that you would check in with him. Uh, later that evening, after the school day was over, I responded, I believe. So you obviously couldn't have met with him that day because the school day was over, correct? She, on... sent, she sent the email at the end of the school day, and I responded approximately two hours after the end of the school day. So you couldn't have met with him that day because the school day was over. Is that fair? He would not have been there. So you would have, would have met with him the next day? Yes. And do you believe that you did meet with him on November 11th? Yes. You spoke with him in the hallway? Yes, I caught him in between classes. You simply told him that you were available if he needed to talk? Yes. There was no further discussion with him at that time? No, because the way the email was written was that he might need to speak with you. So I just wanted to let him know that there was an opening if he wanted to speak with you. And having a rough time, like the, the teacher indicated in her email on November 10th, having a rough time isn't necessarily something that raises red flags. Is that fair? I didn't have any other context as to what was going on. And I just wanted to offer a chance for the student to speak if he needed to do so. And his response, if you recall, was something along the lines of, okay, thanks, okay. And I'm not asking you to quote him because I don't know if you remember. But it, it was not an uncommon response. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was a normal response given the situation. You did not email James Crumbly or his wife about that November 10th email, correct? I did not email them, no. Or the November 11th brief meeting with their son? Correct. You did not forward that email to Mr. Crumbly or his wife? I did not. So then the next interaction that you had with Mr. Crumbly's son was on November 29th of 2021, and that was a Monday, if you recall? Yes, that would have been a Monday. You were forwarded another email that was sent to Nicholas Ejak and Pamela Fine, is that correct? Yes, I was. And this third email, this is the third email you've received from a teacher since this school year began, if you recall. 
Yes, it would have been. September of 21, November 10th of 2021, and now November 29th of 2021. The email advised that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone at the end of class. Uh, could I see the email? Yes. Exhibit 201. This is just the forward, so it doesn't have the actual email. You were advised that that was the concern, was that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone. I believe that to be true, but this email you have on the screen isn't the one that says that. Correct. The email doesn't say it, but you, you were aware that that's why the teacher was concerned Can and that's why the that teacher email? was emailing. I don't know if that's in the email. That email was displayed earlier, I think. It was sent to Mr. E. Jack in this file. That was the one. It's at Unless the bottom. Oh, there, there we go. Thing. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, so this is the email I was forward, forwarded. Um, and it just was at the end of the hour. The teacher didn't get a chance to really find out what was going on, but it just glanced at it um, and had seen that. And I'll leave that up in case you need to look at it. You. So you were aware that on November 29th of 2021, at the time you received this forwarded email, that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone in class? Yes, after reading this email, I was aware. At some point, well, let me go in order. Shortly after this email, you then met with Mr. Crumbly's son and Pamela Fine. Yes. And you met in your office or Ms. Fine's office? It was in Ms. Fine's office. And... You were there just as support, but Ms. Fine did most of the talking. Is that fair? Yes, I would say that was fair. And Ms. Fine talked to Mr. Crumbly's son about looking at bullets on his phone? She did. Um, she actually asked him to describe why would a teacher be contacting me right now. Um, and the student was forthcoming in what, what had happened in class. He was forthcoming. He was honest, to your knowledge, right? To our knowledge. He shared what we had in the email. He told you what class he was in looking at bullets. He said he was looking at bullets, and he even explained why he was looking at bullets, if you recall. He said that he and Mom had been at the shooting range over the weekend, and he was researching what they had done. And if you recall, Ms. Fine acknowledged that what Mr. Crumbly's son was doing may not have been appropriate, but there really didn't seem a lot of concern. Would you, would you agree with that? Well, the concern was that it wasn't appropriate um, and that the concern was then placed by, expressed by placing a phone call home. So the concern was the appropriateness of the behavior in class? Yes. And at that point, a voicemail was left for Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. You said that, um, if you recall, Mr. Crumbly's son was understanding during the meeting. He didn't fight with you about it. He listened, and eventually he went back to class. Yes, I would agree with that. Later in the day, you received an email from the same teacher uh, who expressed that some of Mr. Crumbly's son's prior work may have been a little violent. No, that was in the same email. It's in the same email? It is. Or was it in an email sent later in the day? No, it's in the same email from that morning. It was up on the screen. It's at the bottom of the it. The one from, the one that was originally sent to Mr. E. Jack and Ms. Fine? Yes. That was later forwarded to you? Yes. You didn't see any of those assignments prior to meeting with Mr. Crumbly's son? That is correct. If you had seen those assignments, it probably wouldn't have changed your approach to the meeting, correct? Because the approach was really more about the appropriateness of the behavior. Is that right? I mean, it's a hypothetical of what we would have done. We acted on the information we had. And the, the information that you had was that he was looking at bullets in class. Yes. And looking at bullets is not necessarily something that is in itself concerning to you, correct? I think you're kind of trying to put it in like a pigeonhole. It was trying, we were trying to gain context of what was going on in the situation. Um, because 
a student looking at something on their phone at the end of the hour is different than a student brazenly doing it throughout the entirety of the class. But our conversation was, is this school appropriate or not? And in fact, it's, if you recall, your position is, was at the time, it wasn't necessarily concerning because he was honest about it. It seemed kind of a commonplace thing given the Oxford community and the gun, the gun culture in the Oxford community and things of that nature that you took into a factor. We took a lot of things into a factor, including the fact that we conversed of how it was not school appropriate. And that's why a phone call was placed home. As I just indicated, the Oxford area was and may still be a hunting community, if you know. Okay. I'm asking. People hunt who live at Oxford. In 2021, you would, you would classify it as a hunting community. I would say that there are people who are hunting, yes. Activities with guns were a common hobby in 2021, if you know. I mean, there were people who had guns as a hobby, yes. It was common for students to be interested in guns? I'm sure there are students who are interested in guns. And to go to the, the shooting range? Yes, students would go to the shooting range. So I'm just going to object to make sure that the witness is speaking with personal knowledge. It appears counsel is asking him to give general speculation. Well, if you know, is that if, you, if you know, you're, you're not familiar with gun, very, uh, guns yourself, it sounds like. So just if you know. Okay. Um, students going to the shooting range isn't viewed as unusual or concerning in and of itself. Is that correct? I think that you're taking, that you've got to have context with all of these. Right, and I'm just asking, in and of itself, a student going to the gun range, the shooting range, is not concerning in and of itself. It depends on the context. Because the student weightlifting is not concerning in and of itself unless they're doing it inappropriately, right? So you're, you're taking something that's a broad statement that can have a wide context. And on November 29th of 2021, Mr. Crumbly's son told you and Ms. Fine that he'd gone to the shooting range with his mom the weekend before. Correct. That in itself is not concerning to you. He did it in a way that was appropriate. You would agree... And, I, and can you refresh, refresh my memory? How long were you in the Oxford School District as of 2021? Seven years. And in that seven years, you learned that many households had firearms in the household. Is that, would you agree with that? If you know. What is many? I, there are people More who than own 10? guns. There are people who own guns. Okay. And you, as, as a counselor at the school, you were aware of that? Yes. It wasn't completely unheard of. It was also relevant when looking at the situation, it was also relevant for you to note the fact that Mr. Crumbly's son was not hiding that he was looking at the bullets or didn't hide it from you when he, when he spoke with you and Ms. Fine. Well, he didn't lie about what had happened. And that was important to you? Yes. As a result of the meeting with Ms. Fine, with you and Ms. Fine, Mr. Crumbly's son was not disciplined. To my knowledge, no. There was a phone call placed to his mother, which we've talked about. There was a voicemail left. You did not yourself call Mr. Crumbly. I did not. You did not forward him the emails that you received. I did not. You don't know if that voicemail um, was ever shared with Mr. Crumbly. Is that fair? Well, we talked about it in our meeting the next day. Okay. On the 29th, you don't know if Mr. Crumbly was ever made aware. I would have no way of knowing that. No. Right. You wouldn't know. You responded to the situation of Mr. Crumbly's son looking at bullets on November 29th on his phone with the information that you had. I did. And from what you knew at the time, other than the behavior being inappropriate for school, you didn't see anything else that might have been concerning. Well, and I want to make clear, I wouldn't be the one doing discipline in this situation. So... And I'm asking, and let me clarify, I'm just asking from a counselor's perspective. I'm not asking for discipline. You clarified that Mr. Eject did discipline and Ms. Okay. So could you repeat your question? Please? Yes. As a counselor, on November 29th of 2021, you didn't see anything um, overly concerning about what we've just talked about with looking at bullets on the phone. That the focus was more that looking at bullets on his phone was inappropriate for school. 
So are you asking from a mental health standpoint, did I see anything concerning? Not really. Um, I don't know that, that you're a mental health professional. I mean, you're a school counselor, and you do have some training sure. and education in that. I'm not asking for you to go anywhere outside of your education and experience. Just as a high school counselor sitting in Ms. Fine's office with the information that you had, you didn't see a bunch of red flags. We've talked about, and let me ask, let me give you some, mm -hmm. let me go over it a little bit. You've discussed that you know that there are households in Oxford that have firearms in them, right? Yes, there are. You know that people in Oxford hunt. Some do, yes. You know that students are interested in guns. Some can be, yes. You know that students look at bullets. We had one student who did that in that situation, yes. You know that that student, um, Mr. Crumbly's son, was honest about looking at the bullets when he was asked about it? To the extent of our knowledge, yes, he was. He told you that he'd gone to the shooting range with his mom? Yes. The weekend before? Yes. That... Those things were not concerning to you. Taking those things in a vacuum is why we called home. And That's why Ms. Fine called home. And she said, we had this meeting. We told him it's not appropriate. He understands. No need to call back unless you have questions, right? I don't remember the exact voicemail that was left. The voicemail was not, we need you to come to school right now. To my memory, it was not. But again, I don't remember the exact voicemail that was left. On November 30th of 2021, you received another email. It's this one, Exhibit 202, which um, was from another teacher who was talking about uh, Mr. Crumbly's son looking at a, a video of a guy gunning people down. Correct? Yes, yeah, so this teacher was a co-teacher in that same first hour class. From the day before? Yes. Okay. You reviewed that email on November 30th of 2021? I did. You made the decision to, you didn't, I think you said you didn't see it for about 20 or 30 minutes. I didn't. I was on the phone and I actually responded to it while I was on the phone. Um, and then upon ending that conversation, was going to go meet with the student. And this is the fourth email that you've received about Mr. Crumbly's son since the beginning of the 2021 school year. Yes. The third email in two days. Uh, is it? You would have received the... I think it's the second in two days. The November 29th email about the bullets, and then you do you recall receiving a follow-up email later that day? It was a confirmation of that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this is the second one with additional information. Okay. The second one on a different a different issue. Is that yes. fair? Okay. Yes. The teacher described the video as a movie scene, but not a real event. Yeah, she said it looks like it's a movie scene and not security footage slash a real event. She expressed some concern based on quote some of his other behaviors. Yeah, but definitely still concerning when taking into account some of his other behaviors, yes. You did not forward this email to Mr. Crumbly after you received it? Well, no, but over an hour later, I called him into the school. Right. And you decided after receiving this email that you were going to meet with Mr. Crumbly's son? Yes. Approximately an hour after receiving this email, Mr. Ejack advised you of another report made by a teacher about Mr. Crumbly's son. Yes, as I was about to go and um, call down his son, Mr. Ejack actually came into my office with information about the math assignment. And that there were some concerning comments and markings on the math assignment. I didn't have any context about the math assignment. I just knew there was something, something about it. At that point, you hadn't seen it. You were just I going know. off of what you were being told. Is that fair? That is fair. Okay. So you went to Mr. Crumbly's son's classroom? I did. You, you called him out of class? I walked to his classroom. Uh, yeah, I, I, when I called out, I meant like at his classroom. You went and got him. Yes. Okay. Um, while you were there, you also obtained a copy of the worksheet that we've seen. I did. And that would have been what I call the modified worksheet. That would be the one that had the things scratched out and the words added that you identified and things like that. Yes. Okay. You and Mr. Crumbly's son went back to your office where Nicholas Ejack was, was waiting in your office, if you recall. Yes, that is correct. It was at that point or shortly thereafter that you called Mr. Crumbly's wife? 
approximately 20 minutes into our meeting, yes. So you met with, with Mr. Crumbly's son for about 20 minutes? Yes. It was during that meeting that Mr. Crumbly's son told you about um, his family member passing away? He did. About his dog passing away? Yes. About his friend moving away? Yes. He talked about COVID being hard on him? Yes. He had a hard time with virtual school, if you remember? He did say that, yes. And um, you asked about the drawings and the markings and, and the things on the assignment that you had in front of you. Yes, I asked him to clarify what was going on in the assignment, but I also talked about the email I had received, and I had also talked about in context of the conversation we had yesterday. Okay. So some of the meeting was about inappropriate behavior. Is that fair? It started off with a conversation about that. Um, because I didn't know what was on the phone, um, so I asked him what he was watching. Okay. Um, and then we talked about, look, we just had a conversation yesterday about appropriate behavior in class. This feels like the same thing that we're dealing with here. Um, and after we had talked about that for a few minutes, I brought the math sheet out and asked him to start explaining to me what was on there. And when the prosecutor was asking you questions, you said initially when you got that email around 8, well, around 8.30 when you saw the email um, from the teacher, initially you were frustrated. In fact, you used the word frustrated. I was frustrated. And yes. it was kind of like, we just talked about this yesterday. Is that, does that kind of explain what, what you were feeling at the time? Yes, I would say that it was, we just had a conversation about this. Why am I hearing about something similar again? So... You talked a little bit about that, and then you, you talked about the homework, or the, I'm sorry, the math assignment or the math paper that we saw, and you asked for some more context about what was on the paper. Well, initially I asked him to just describe what was on the paper, and he started talking about how it was a video game, um, that he liked designing them, liked drawing them. And then I asked for him to explain the words on it, because I didn't feel those were as easily explained by simply stating, well, it's a video game. And in fact, you said that you didn't want to give context to his words. You didn't want to assume what he meant. You wanted to hear from him what those words meant. Yes. And he gave context. He did. His, that's when his demeanor changed from kind of being like, what do I have to say to get out of here and to stop getting in trouble, to I, like he became sad. And you, you expressed, you used the word appropriate to describe his level of sadness based on what he was telling you? The way he was acting matched what he was saying. It, it's, to me, it's sad if a, a family dog dies or a family pet dies. It's sad if a relative dies or a friend moves away. So his, his demeanor matched what he was saying. And again, in and of itself, being sad is something that you talked about you saw an increase of after COVID in your students. Do you recall that? Yes. And that, and that that was not, again, in and of itself. And I'm, and I'm not asking you to, I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you by asking these questions. Um, I'm not trying to, to give meaning to something that isn't there. I'm asking you, based on the information that you had at the time, you felt that his, his sadness was an appropriate level of sadness not overly concerning. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but the sadness itself was not necessarily overly concerning beyond wanting him to talk with someone. Appropriate and concerning are two different things. Okay. When I say appropriate, I mean it matched with what he was saying. Something can be an appropriate response, but also be heavily concerning, right? Like, I don't know a good example off the top of my head, but... What, what I'm saying is his demeanor matched with what he was saying, but to me it was concerning, which right. is why I called parents. Right, exactly why you called parents. So if he had been sitting in front of you and talked about these losses and it was kind of like, yeah, it's no big deal, it's not a big deal, that could also be concerning. It would be a different type of concern, okay. yes. If he said, um, I, I lost the top to my pen and was crumbling in pieces and falling into a puddle of tears on your floor, that would be concerning, but for different reasons. It, it would be memorable okay. concerning, yes. So, the losses that he experienced, you agree, I think we can all agree, were significant. I think when taken in totality, yeah, yeah. 
And he was showing you that he was sad. Yes. He was also expressing during this meeting that he had concerns about missing class, if you recall. He did, uh, especially as after um, classes changed, which is a normal thing. Um, he expressed that he was worried about missing his chemistry class, which was his next class after the math class. Um, so during that time, Mr. Ejack went and retrieved his belongings and went to go get homework for his chemistry class. And I'm going to go over that in just a second, too. But um, if you recall, and I don't know if you, you pay close attention to your students' attendance, but if you recall, Mr. Crumpley's son had pretty good attendance. He did. He didn't miss school a lot. No, he did not. He, if you recall, his grades weren't great. No, but he was on track for graduation. He was passing. I believe he was failing one class at the time, and it was not by much. So he was close to passing all of, at all of his classes. One of them he was failing, but close to passing. Yes. So his attendance and his grades obviously were not overly concerning to you. I wouldn't say overly concerning, but a student who cares about class and, and wants to you know, he had expressed an argument the night before um, and, and wanted to go to class, had expressed, you know, frustration of missing school during COVID and, and just that entirety. So it, it wasn't strange at that point to have a student not want to miss class. Right. That wasn't odd to you at all, given his history. Now, if he were somebody who missed school all the time and was failing all his classes, he's like, I really want to be in school. I really want to do my homework. You might feel a little differently. Is that fair? I would say it was in line based with the information I had. Okay. And you said that after Mr. Crumbly's son expressed these concerns about missing class, that Mr. Ejack went to his it was the first hour class to get the backpack? It would have been in his second hour class where his belongings were, yes. So he went, uh, Mr. Ejack went to his second hour class to get his belongings and brought his belongings back to your office. Yes, this would have been after we had confirmed parents were coming, um, probably a, a little after 10 a.m. He, if you recall, began working on schoolwork, waiting for his parents to get there. That is, that is my recollection, yes. Also, if you remember, while you were waiting for his parents, you also began watching some videos with him? Yep, so he had expressed different things he wanted to do after high school. Um, and he had expressed wanting to go into video game design. I know that when students are waiting for parents, it can be high anxiety time for them. So I wanted to try and engage him as best as I could. So we actually watched videos from the uh, OTEC, the Technical Center campus, where they had programs that were centered around what he wanted to do. Um, so we talked about what it would look like uh, to do an application for them because he was a sophomore and he would be able to apply for the next school year. Um, and so I did that one to, to kind of just bridge that time that could be high anxiety and two, if you have any inkling that a student may potentially be displaying any signs of, of suicide or suicidal ideation, getting a gauge of future plans is crucial. So I wanted to get that gauge as well. And he did that, and he, he picked out some videos to watch, is that fair? And, and you picked some out? Yeah. You also asked him during that time if he was a threat to himself or anyone else. I asked him that earlier. And that is part of your assessment of the situation, is that fair? Well, it was a question I felt needed to be asked based on what I had. And based on your education, your experience, and your training, you know that that's an important question to ask. In that situation, yes. And he, he basically said, I know this looks bad, but I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, it, it wasn't said as flippantly, but it was, it, he understood, like, I can see why this looks bad. I'm not going to do anything. Okay. So, although you had concerns, you also had the student in front of you reassuring you that he was not going to hurt himself or anyone else. Based on what he told me, yes. His wife arrived at approximately 10:30. I think that there's a there was some time lag between them getting to the school and, and actually getting into your office of about 10 minutes, if you recall. 
Okay, I, I don't know when they arrived at the school. I know when they arrived to my office. Their son was in your office when they got there? Yes. Mr. Ejack came into the office after Mr. Crumley's wife came into your office? Yes. Because okay. at some point he left while you were sitting with Mr. Crumley's son? He left once we had confirmed that parents were coming. Mr. Ejack comes back in. When Mr. Crumbly and his wife walk in, Mr. Uh, I just want to lay the, the room out a little bit. So there's your desk. You're on one side. On the other side was Mr. Crumbly's son? Yes. There was a second chair in front of your desk? Yes. Mr. Crumbly sat in the second chair next to his son? Yes. And then Mrs. Crumbly sat in a third chair that was available in uh, kind of, was it behind Mr. Crumbly a little bit? So there were two across from my desk, and then there was one that was kind of off on a corner. Um, okay. And that's where she sat. Your office was not the size of this room, is that fair? Yeah, that is fair. Okay. Um, Fairly small? It, it's not small. It's, it's a decent-sized office, but it had space where there were two seats across from me, one seat kind of on a kitty corner, a door, um, and then some space kind of off to what would have been my right as I was sitting in my office. And Mr. Ejack would have been kind of off to your right, is that fair? Yes. Okay. So he wasn't sitting in one of the three or, or four chairs with your, with your chair? He was kind of off to the side? That is correct. You testified with the, when the prosecutor was asking you questions that while you were talking with Mrs. Crumbly, that you recall Mr. Crumbly was interacting with his son. I do. Um, you said that Mr. Crumbly looked at the math assignment, the modified math assignment, because that's the one that you had, that he looked at the modified math assignment with his son. That is correct. They looked at it together and that he, he showed concern for his son. Yeah, uh, it, it felt like he was interacting with his son and that he, he mentioned some things that were available for his son. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, you felt that Mr. Crumbly's interactions with his son, that he was showing the appropriate level of care and, and caring for him at that point in your office. Yes, I, I'm a, on the surface level, yes, yes. You confirmed um, that Mr. Crumbly's son had gone to the shooting range the weekend before. I did. You confirmed that he had those, those losses. He lost a family member, his uh, family dog, and a friend had moved away, that he experienced all those things in the year of 2021. I also asked, that, and he had mentioned the argument the night before as well. And they told you about the argument? They, they confirmed that there had been a disagreement. Yes. It's not uncommon for 15-year-olds to argue with their parents. Is that fair? In, in a surface-level statement, yes, that can happen. Um, Mrs. Crumbly also confirmed that her son had struggled with virtual school during COVID. She did. And yes. that confirms what Mr. Crumbly's son had also told you about not, not liking virtual school. Yes. You told Mr. Crumbly and his wife that, well, let me back up a little bit. You told the prosecutor that your hope was that Mr. Crumbly and his wife would take their son out of school, either get, them, get him to see someone to talk to, or to go have a really fun day. My words to them were I'd like him to, to get help as soon as possible, today if possible. And so you expressed to them that you wanted him to get help as soon as possible, today if possible. Yes. And Mrs. Crumbly said, we can't do today, we have to go back to work. Yes. They assured you though, or at least you felt assured, that they were going to get him help. They, they, were, they were not against it, and they made it seem as if they would be something that they would be willing to do. Okay. So you handed these three sheets of paper to one of them. They didn't toss it in the garbage, right? Not in front of me, no. Right. They didn't scoff about it and say, we're not doing this. They took the paper. Right. So you had no reason to believe that they weren't going to get their help, either at some point, get their son help, either some point that day or as soon as possible. Based on the conversation, no, but that's also why I planned the follow-up meeting with the student the next day was to ensure that there was some movement. And you plan the follow-up meeting kind of in, in, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but you kind of plan that in your head, like this is my next step. Yes. Okay. You didn't express that during the meeting? No. In the meeting, you expressed that you were going to follow up in about 48 hours. Well, because when mom said that today wasn't an option, I said 48 hours then, I'll be following up. Okay. 
So in your mind, you had some kind of timing that you were going to follow up to make sure that things were being followed through on. Obviously, we know that that, that first check-in point didn't come. Um, but you told them within 48 hours you wanted something done by the next morning. And based on your meeting, you didn't have any reason to think that Mr. Crumley or his wife were not going to follow up. I would agree. Essentially, you wanted to ensure, and, and I believe that you expressed this to Mr. Crumley and his wife, wanted to ensure that their son's situation and his sadness didn't get worse. Right. I wanted to ensure that we had something that, if left unchecked, could get worse. Right. So, sitting in the meeting, you weren't concerned necessarily that that day, or even by the next morning, that their son was going to harm himself. Based on what he had told me, I did not believe him to be actively harming himself, no. Or anyone else? Based on what he had told me, no. Mr. Crumbly's son expressed that he wanted to stay in school. He did. He wanted to stay in school for some of the reasons we've discussed. He didn't like virtual school. He wanted to make sure he could stay up with school. He didn't want to miss class. These are some of the reasons that he gave you. Yes, those were, those were some of the reasons. He, he really just said that I, I struggled with virtual school. I want to make sure I'm staying on top of what I have to do. And that wasn't concerning to you, that he wanted to stay in school? No. Obviously, it's not concerning, right? In, in that situation, no. I, it's, it's not, but it, given the context of what I was hoping, I, you take the kids' desires into consideration, but at the end of the day, you, you want a team making that decision. And if you recall, you had just had two virtual days of school, I think the week before. Yes, leading up to Thanksgiving, uh, we did have days that were virtual. And we talked about this a little while ago. To your knowledge, if you recall, and if you don't, just please tell me, he'd only missed one day of school that school year. I, I know he had good attendance. I don't remember the exact days. With Mrs. Crumbly expressing that she and Mr. Crumbly had to return to work that day, and Mr. Crumbly's son expressing a desire to stay in school, you felt that it was okay for Mr. Crumbly's son to remain in school? I felt that I was not given full options at that point because really what I was left trying to decide between was I have parents saying they have to return to work. I have a student that I don't want left alone. Um, and so that's when I asked Mr. Ejack, is there anything from a discipline standpoint, is there any reason he can't stay in school, is there anything you need to do? Um, and then I made the decision, I, I made a judgment call based on what I I had is I didn't want a student potentially home alone. So based on the information that you had, you decided that it was okay for him to remain in school? I decided that that was the best decision I thought I could make on the information. Okay. Based on that meeting, Mr. Crumbly's son to your knowledge, was not contemplating suicide. You said that he had suicidal ideations, that ideations, but that's different than being actively suicidal. It is. Uh, the student stated that he was not, he was not actively suicidal. You knew that he had been to the gun range with his mom the weekend prior. Yes. You knew at a minimum that he had access to a firearm the weekend before because he went to the gun range. I knew that he had been to a gun range and that he used a firearm at a gun range, yes. You did not ask him on November 30th of 2021 if he had access to a firearm? I did not. You had no reason to look into whether or not he had access to a firearm. Would you agree with that? Based on the information that you had. It, it's easy to go in hindsight on a lot of things. Um, based on what my concerns were, I was concerned about student well-being. And again, you said it's easy to go in hindsight. So we know what happened within a couple hours of this meeting. Sure. We all in this courtroom know what happened. It's easy for us to look back and say that different decisions could have been made, right? 
I made the decisions I made based on the information I had. At the time? At the time. You don't have the benefit of hindsight at 10.40 or 10.50 a.m. on November 30th of 2021. Is that fair? I had 90 minutes of information. You suggested that his parents find a therapist for him to talk to or evaluate him. I did. You have had experience with parents who have refused to provide mental health treatment to their child. Is that, is that accurate? Do you recall that? Off the top of my head, I'm not recalling a specific instance of that. If it occurred, do you remember uh, testifying previously about that? I, I don't, no. Okay. Would reviewing your testimony on that help to refresh your recollection? If we want to bring it up, sure. May I approach your honor? Sure. Thank you. We would like to read the highlighted portions. You can just read that to yourself and let us know if it refreshes your recollection. All right. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, so I, I've asked, um, like, if it's occurred, and I say it's not overly common, but I'm sure it does happen. Um, but I'm giving a for instance of what we would do in that type of situation if it were to happen. May I approach her? Sure. Thank you. So reviewing, based on what you just said, reviewing the transcript has helped to refresh your recollection. Well, what I'm stating in the transcript is in a situation where that could happen, that what we would do is involve CPS and make sure that the student is receiving ordinary care. In fact, the question was... You told the jury what CPS is. Child Protective Services would be involved if that situation were to occur. In is fact, the, the question was, thank you, okay. Had you ever dealt with a kid at school who you felt needed psychiatric care and yet the parents didn't provide it in some fashion or another? Your answer was, yes, that had occurred. And then I go on to explain what would happen in that type of situation. Right. You said it's not a really common, it does happen. If it did happen, this is what we would do. Correct? Correct. And I know I've asked this a couple of times, but you didn't have any reason to believe on November 30th of 2021 that James Crumbly or his wife were not going to follow through and obtain a therapist for their child to talk to. I didn't have enough time to know if that would happen or not. Um, given our context of our conversation, no, I didn't have reason to believe that at that time. If you recall, the meeting with Mr. Crumbly and his wife and their son concluded at approximately 10.50 in the morning? That sounds about right, yes. Um, their son left the room first, if you recall, and went back to class? Yes. The shooting occurred at approximately, began at approximately 12.51 p.m. that day. After you heard that there was a shooter at the school, you did not immediately suspect that it was Mr. Crumbly's son, if you remember. I did not. In fact, you didn't suspect that it was Mr. Crumbly's son until you looked into his attendance after the shooting. Correct. This is also after Mr. Crumbly's son had already been arrested. Quite a bit after this. Yes. I'm going to talk about just a few things. Just go back to your direct testimony with the prosecutor. You said that calling a parent in is a high level of concern. Yes. And that could be a concern for appropriate behavior. It could be, yes. It could be a concern for the student's well-being. It could be. It could be a concern that the student needs immediate care or help. Yes. It could be for any number of reasons. A high level of concern is dependent on the situation. Is that fair? Yes, I would agree. Your concern with going to Mr. Crumbly's son's class on November 30th of 2021 is you specifically mentioned that you went because it's it doesn't raise it doesn't basically raise concern or, or red flags if a counselor goes down to get a student out of class. Yes, that is true. Um, and I had very little information at that point as to what was going on. So I wanted to, to make sure to do it. And I knew that the dean wanted me involved in a conversation. Um, so I knew that student support was at least a potential plan at that point. 
when you were discussing, you said that um, you told Mr. Crumbly's son uh, while you were meeting with him before his parents got there that you wanted his parents to get him help. Do you remember discussing that with the prosecution? I do. Okay. At that time, Mr. Crumbly's son didn't say, thank goodness, I've been begging my parents for help and they haven't given it to me. I'm not sure many students would. He didn't say, um, I'm glad you're going to ask them because I've asked them and they didn't listen. He did not say that, no. He didn't say, I, I really need this and I'm really glad that you're, that you're doing this for me. He did not. He didn't say any of that. No, which also would not be, it, it's not uncommon for students to not have a big response to something like that. If he had said any of those things, obviously your reaction would be different when Mr. Crumbly and his wife got to the school. It would be different information that I did not have, yes. And when Mr. Crumbly and his wife were at the school, they also didn't say anything about, or Mr. Crumbly didn't say anything specifically about, um, wow, Son, you, you, you really did need some help. You've been asking me for it, right? No. The discussion was simply looking at the math assignment, the modified math assignment, and then Mr. Crumbly expressing to his son, you know you have people to talk to, right? That was a piece of it over the 10 minutes, yes. That, um, that they've talked. Mr. Crumbly and his son have yep. spoken. He did, he did say that they talked. When discussing the impact of Mr. Crumbly's son's friend leaving, you don't know that Mr. Crumbly's son had ever expressed how significant that impact was on him. Is that I, fair? Until had, sitting in your office. I had very little context, even when he was in my office, over what that was. All I knew was that a friend had left recently and moved, and that was hard. You indicated on your direct testimony with Mr. with Mr. Keese that Mr. Crumbly mentioned you have people you can talk to, we talk, um, and then mentioned something, your testimony was that, that his son mentioned something about a journal, or I'm sorry, that Mr. Crumbly mentioned something about a journal. Mr. Crumbly's statement to, to my recollection was, you have your counselor, you have your journal, we talk. Okay. Mr. Crumbly didn't say, your journal, you know the one that's in your backpack. He didn't say the one that you always keep with you? No. He didn't say a color? No. He didn't describe it at all? No. So to your knowledge, based on that conversation, you can't say that Mr. Crumbly's son knew what his son's journal would look like if he had a journal? Based on that conversation? I, I No. I had no knowledge beyond that there was an existence of some sort of journal. One moment, Ron. Sure. <coughs> Mr. Hopkins, you made decisions on November 30th of 2021 based on your education, your training, and your experience, correct? That was a piece of it. Also based on the information that you had in front of you. That was a majority of it. Which included four emails from teachers in approximately two months regarding Mr. Crumbly's son. That was a part of it, yes. Concerns that those teachers had raised. Yes, that was a part of it. Much of which you did not share with Mr. Crumbly prior to that November 30th meeting. Is that fair? Correct. It was shared during the meeting. Based on all of these things, you did not believe that Mr. Crumbly's son was an immediate danger to himself. I did not believe that, no. Nor did you believe that he was a danger to anyone else? Based on the information I had, no. I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Hopkins, it appears that information and context would be important to you in these kinds of meetings. Yes, it would. Okay. Now, did James Crumbly tell you that November 30th wasn't the first time that his son asked for help? No. Did James Crumbly tell you that his son asked for help in April of 2021? No. Did James Crumbly tell you that Despite that, never once was an appointment with a medical health provider set up. No. Did James Crumley ever tell you that 
as early as, as June of 2021, his son had obtained his own firearm. Yeah. Did Gene Tremley tell you that his son had been begging for a 9mm firearm? No. Did, his son, did Gene Tremley tell you that his son actually sent him a screenshot of a 9mm for sale a few weeks before the meeting? No. <clears throat> did Gene Tremley tell you that his son actually obtained a 9mm just four days before this meeting? No. Did James Trimley tell you that the 9mm he obtained looked identical to the 9mm that he drew right here on this picture? No. Did James Trimley tell you that he worked for DoorDash, he hadn't begun work that day and he could have taken his son, taken his son home? No. Did he tell you that when his son was talking about his friend leaving, it was actually his only friend? No. So you took what you learned from the defendant's son you described those losses he felt as significant? I did. And that's without knowing all that information? Yes. You mentioned that you would hope that a decision about a student would be made by a team. I did. Who's on the team? The student, the parents, and any caring adult at the school. And did either James or Jennifer Crumbly share any information with you? I did not. Had they of, what would you have done? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. She was. She asked the same question on cross. Did you ask that question? She asked, "What would you have done?" Talking about calling CPS and such. I, I no, actually, that was related to if they had. Well, she asked if he had, if they had not obtained uh, treatment for their son. Yes. By the following day or within forty eight hours. If they had refused, him. actually, if they had refused to obtain mental health treatment, what would he have done? Not. I'll rephrase, Judge. That's fine. Mr. Hopkins, you testified earlier that your plan was to call Child Protective Services in 48 hours? Yes. And they, that's based upon just the information that you learned from the defendant's son? It is. Would this meeting have ended differently had you known all the other information that we just went through? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. I think it does come for speculation. I believe he can offer a definitive answer here, Judge. A definitive answer about uh, what would have happened if they had not um, contacted a therapist? No, Your Honor. He's asking about a definitive answer for what Mr. Hopkins would have done if there had been additional information. And Your Honor, can we approach? Because I can we approach, please? Okay. Can we turn off the mic? Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. You were asked on uh, cross-examination that you didn't ask the shooter on November 30th if he had access to a gun. Do you remember that? I do. And your response was what? I did not. Okay. And did you have reason to ask him about that? At that time, I didn't feel I did. And you were, you were asked about the shooter's recitation of what happened at the shooting range with his mother. I, are you stating I asked that? No, you were asked that. Oh, you, by cross. Okay, so you okay. learned on November the 29th, November the 30th, that the defendant's son went to a shooting range with his mother that prior weekend. I did. Did James Kremley tell you that the shooter actually shot his new gun? No. Thank you. I have nothing further. Wait, you can step down and excuse.